just a little bit of background um, as a geologist that we know that there are specific reasons why we have erosion and sedimentation. Some of these are global in scale, some are local in scale, some are anthropogenic, some are not. But uh, we do know that our sources of sediment uh, originate from natural stream channel erosion and from man-made sources that come from land disturbance. Now this, this uh, uh, photograph is, is, um, is, is a very good photograph to show when we're talking about sedimentation. Of course, this is canyon lands out in, uh, in central Utah. And what happened in this area is that we had a major geologic uplift. That entire area was lifted up due to tectonics of, of, that, of the western United States. And when you lift up a land mass, and then it is much higher relative to sea level, well, the first thing that, that surface water drainage is going to want to do is to get back to sea level. And it will do, it will do amazing things to do that. And so that, for that reason, the Green River and the, and the uh, Colorado River have cut these canyons in an attempt to erode back down to their base level, which would be the sea level in the Pacific Ocean. So this is a naturally occurring sedimentation based on a geologic event. The other way that we can have natural uh, catastrophic regional or worldwide uh, changes in sedimentation rates is from fallen sea level. And we have seen this cyclicity over geologic time uh, and we have mapped these changes in sea level throughout geologic time. And when we have fallen sea level, we establish new base levels for all of our streams. And again, they will attempt to get down to their original base level. And so they will erode in order to do that. Uh, the coastal plain of Alabama is a, is a good example where this area and just south of here uh, was a strand line at one time was a, a seashore. And then right now we're, we're at, a, at a relatively low global sea level. And so when the, when the ocean is retreated, then that's the reason that we have down cutting and erosion of the Appalachian Mountains and, and the coastal plain into the Gulf of Mexico Basin. Localized um, sedimentation is caused by, a lot of times, by lowering of water types. We've seen this during the droughts that we had in 2000, 2007. We've observed this in, in numerous areas where actually the water table <coughs> had dropped out from under a lot of our upland streams, dropped out from under the, the stream channel. And at that point, that stream will attempt to downcut to get back to the water table. So actually, it was weird that in some of these projects where we were monitoring uh, bed load, uh, we actually saw an increase in the rate of bed load movement during base flood. And that's something that we never thought about. We usually think about increased sedimentation when you have increased runoff. But you also get increased sedimentation uh, when you get to an extreme drought condition because that stream is going to down cut to try to get back to the water table. And then, of course, increased runoff. And that can be uh, natural if you have if you're in a, in a climate scenario where you have increased precipitation, and I'll show you uh, in my, in my Dolly Creek data, I'll show you what happens during a dry year in that wet year, but then also uh, anthropogenic uh, issues include uh, land use change. We have much more impervious surface, much more runoff, and then the, the result is going to be much greater rates of sedimentation. Okay, so we're looking at two things when we talk about sediment. We're looking at the, at the water column and the very small particles that are suspended uh, temporarily or sometimes permanently, if you're talking about colloid, in the water column, and that's suspended sediment. And then the larger particles, which you've seen that salt take, uh, uh, roll or salt take down the stream uh, in the form of, of a sand bed or you've seen dunes moving down the stream, then that's going to be the bed load. So the trick is to be able to accurately measure both the bed load and the suspended load and then so that we get total load. Uh, if you look at the literature that's available uh, 
over over time, uh, most of all the data that you are going to find is going to be suspended uh, sediment data. And the reason is because that's very easy, easy to measure. You take a water sample and you, and you actually you just pull the, the uh, solids out of it, and then you know how much suspended sediment you have. Uh, bed load is a little, little harder, a little tougher nut to crack, and that's where we developed a method where we can act accurately monitor and measure uh, the rates of, of bed load movement. And so we, we need to combine those two to get a total sediment load. Okay, so the way that we do this, uh, <coughs> both for bed load and for suspended load, is, is using <coughs> the regression. And for our suspended load, the model that we have selected is um, the USGS 7 parameter loading model that was developed by Tim Kahn at USGS. And uh, we, we think that this uh, is, is a still, I mean, this, this uh, model is sort of dated, but I think it's still as good as anything out there. And we were fortunate enough to, uh, EPA had taken Tim's uh, Fortran code and had uh, contracted with uh, Peter Richards at Heidelberg College to uh, translate that into an Excel uh, spreadsheet model. And so we were fortunate enough to get a hold of a copy of that model. So this is an Excel adaptation of that seven parameter model. It really just takes a uh, discharge and whatever parameter you have, it'll work on anything. It works on nutrients, it works on, uh, on suspended sediment, but uh, you just uh, creates a regression between those two the suspended sediment and discharge, and then calculates a load. So right now, uh, since about 1998, we have uh, estimated loading, sediment loadings, on about 55 streams in the state, 55 washes, and this is the distribution of those. Uh, and so the data that I'm going to show you, start out showing you, is our Gantt point A. And this is. Um, there are two reservoirs in Conecuh County. Uh, these are operated by uh, Power South. They are uh, used for uh, hydropower generation. But uh, Power South will tell you that they really don't. They really don't generate any power. So that you know means much. But they mainly operate these as um, for real estate purposes. Where they've been developed and the residences around these, these um, reservoirs. Uh, and they're on the Conecuh, they're in Pounds of the Conecuh River in North Covington County, just north of Andalusia. And um, they have a lot of dirt roads around them. This is a very rural area. Covington County, as I understand, has more miles of dirt roads than any other county in the state. And so we see a lot of problems in Covington County. So much so that the county now. Uh, whenever any group comes in, monitors or uh, finds problems related to dirt road contributions to a particular stream, uh, the county commission just doesn't want to hear it anymore. They just, uh, they just will refuse to, to deal with it. It's just overwhelming. They need some help down there. Okay, so uh, this is sort of hard to see. This is a, just a Google shot. But, uh, this is Gant Lake. So the Conecuh River flows through northern Covington County like this. Uh, we've got Gant Lake, um, and then we've got uh, Point A Lake just downstream. We were fortunate, very fortunate, that when we were doing this project, they were uh, going through their relicensing. And Fish and Wildlife had filed a complaint about dissolved oxygen levels below the dams. And so uh, Power South, uh, was one of their things that they had to do for the relicensing was to retrofit the dams with uh, aerators. And in order to do that, they had to drop the level, they had to essentially drain the reservoirs. And so we were able to see something you rarely ever see, and that is the, uh, the alluvial fans that build out into impoundments. Uh, I, I've never seen this before. And so this is an alluvial fan for one of our sites. And you can see how the lake level is, is just a small amount of water in the bottom of the lake. And so 
this is how much sediment, we knew how much sediment had been deposited in the lake and we were able to actually measure that. Um, so that was a, an interesting thing that we didn't think we'd be able to do. Okay, so site one uh, is, uh, the watershed is very small, 53 acres, uh, Holiday Hill Road uh, is an unpaved road that comes along the, the side of the reservoir and this this area has some pretty extreme topography. So most of these roads come from high elevation and go down into the, the river uh, valley. And so we, we have a lot of elevation, a lot of relief uh, on these roads, which contributes to the problem. So we had this sediment deposition out in the lake we were able to measure, and then our monitoring site was right at the road crossing uh, for this small stream that flows into the lake. This is the uh, part of the alluvial fan. So this is normally covered in water. So you can see how much sediment. Here's another one over here and then another one over here. And then this is another view back landward. Uh, so this is also a good example that when they drop the lake level, then they establish the, the streams all establish new base levels. And so this is exactly, this is canyon lands, but in a 53 acre watershed. So you can see what the stream was doing. Amazing, that stream is one foot wide and about six, eight inches deep. And you can see what it did in just a matter of two or three weeks. And then the stratification was interesting because we were able to see that annual, just like tree rings, uh, sediment in alluvial fans is deposited uh, seasonally. You get low flow where you get uh, fine particles deposited. And then during high flow, which would be uh, January, February, March, we get uh, larger particles. So the, the clays are the darker bands. The, and then during the winter, we get the larger particles, which are the light. So we know each year, you can actually count how many years it took to, to deposit that sediment. Okay, here's the problem. And this is probably familiar to you. Uh, this is typical of a lot of black county unpaved roads. We're coming off the hill and got the ditches being eroded. The, the, uh, the one thing that Covington County has done historically that I never understood is that uh, they, they don't have a source for aggregate. It's just a pile of sand down there. And so, uh, so uh, what they will do sometimes if they have enough money, they'll haul limestone aggregate from Shelby County. You can imagine what, how expensive that is. So that's a pretty rare occurrence. But normally what they will do is go out and establish a sand pit and they will haul sand and dump it out here and just grade it on the roads. And then in three months, it's in the stream channel. And then three months later, they haul it out there and they spread it out again. Uh, they just don't have no gravel down there, no gravel or limestone. Okay, so I'm sort of jumping ahead, but I'm going to show you some of the remediation. Uh, we, uh, I'll tell you a little story about the remediation here. This project was funded with EPA money through AD. That was the funding source uh, for the remediation. The, remedi the remedial uh, actions were designed and implemented by the county and by NRCS. And a lot of you may know Steve Yelton, who's the district conservationist for Cohen County. He's a wonderful guy. So Steve says, well, we've tried all these things in the past, and we put a lot of money out there, and it either doesn't last or it just doesn't work. And so the only way we're going to do this because of the relief is if we can get some kind of pavement out there. And immediately EPA said, no, we don't pave roads. And so Steve said, okay, we don't have a project. And so EPA relented and they them and said, we'll do it. And so what they ended up doing, so this might be disappointing to you, but, um, but it, it was more of a, a permanent fix. And that is, this is what they call chip seal. And I'm, like I said, I'm not an engineer, but most of you know what that is. It's a very inexpensive way. To, it's a poor man's pavement, I guess. And then uh, they did a lot of treatment of the, of the ditches with just using 
rip it out. And a lot of grading to, to uh, lower the slopes and that kind of thing. So there was a lot of work went into this and a lot of planning. Uh, so that's our site window. This was the, the regression for the total suspended solids. And you can see we had a pretty good, a pretty good regression here, going from low discharge to high discharge. And you'll see that my high discharge was only one cubic foot per second. So it's a very small stream. But you can see what the impact, it had a huge impact on the, on the reservoir. But, um, but it's a very small stream. And now, uh, so here is the, Pre-treatment period, uh, along with the um, what I call post-treatment stabilization, and then after the site stabilized, there are three periods of time when you are monitoring and treating uh, a stream that has a sedimentation problem. Uh, you have a pre-treatment monitoring where you're just getting what's going on out there, with no no impacts other than just what's going on in the watershed. Then you come in and you, you put in your remediation. And that involves some excavation and moving dirt and doing a lot of things, disturbance. And so you, for a short time, you're gonna make things a whole lot worse. But then it's gonna get a whole lot better. So this is that stabilization period after we put in the, uh, so they started right here putting in the treatments. And you can see what happened. It looked like it was a disaster for a while. But then it stabilized, and then you can see what the result was. We almost had, we almost had no sediment, uh, suspended sediment, in the stream after that point. And you can see our discharge, we had some pretty high discharge events, but still the sediment didn't come up. So we knew that our treatment was very effective. And then I, apply, I just plotted the pre-treatment, which is the red dots, and the, and the post-treatment, which were the blue. And that was for suspended. And then this was the bed load. Um, so this was a bed, best fit curve on the bed load, best fit curve on the suspended load. So, I mean, I'm sorry, on the bed load, this was bed load, pre-treatment, and post-treatment. So I knew that we had, had made a, a difference there. And this was the result, uh, pre-treatment, Suspended um, load was about 5.1 tons per year. Post treatment was 4.6. Uh, bed sediment was about 110 tons per year. Post treatment 57. So a total, if we went from 115 down to 62, so we had a 46% reduction in total sediment load. And uh, also, the other thing you'll notice is that you know I told you that most of the monitoring that goes on is for suspended. Well, if you didn't monitor your bed load, you would have essentially missed all your load. This stream, almost all the load is bed load. So if you didn't, if you didn't monitor your bed load, you really wouldn't have a good idea of what the stream was, was doing. Okay, this, um, the other thing that, that's interesting in these streams, and you'll see this, um, whenever you do uh, remediation. The, when you have a large, an excessive sediment load, especially an excessive bed load, then you're gonna restrict the amount of, of uh, sediment that that stream can move. I mean, uh, the stream only has so much energy. And so, um, and so when you restrict the amount of sediment that goes into that stream, Essentially, that stream is going to establish a new base level because it's going to it's going to take that sediment, that excessive sediment, it's going to move it out because there's not a, a load continuing to feed into the watershed. See these stumps? This stream channel, this stream channel used to be way up here. It's a foot and a half. We had a foot and a half of sediment. When we cut that sediment load off, this stream channel cut back down to what I'm sure it looked like, you know, originally. And these, these stumps were exposed in the channel of the stream that we had never even seen before. And so one of the positive things I can tell you, and we've done this in, in, in numerous marshes, that stream 
has a desire to correct itself and to do what it was originally supposed to do. So if you give it a little help, that's all it needs. It just needs a little push. It will do the job for you. A lot of people come to us and say, well, our stream's destroyed. It, it never will be the way that it used to be. And I tell them, if you'll just help it a little bit, primarily upstream, the headwaters are so important. If you can restrict what's going on, the impacts in your headwaters, and then work your way downstream, that's the little push that this stream's going to need. And it will, it will cut right back down, establish a new channel, vegetation will come back. It just needs a little help. And so that's what we saw here. It was amazing what this little stream did. OK, our site two, also 53 acres. Um, this is an intermittent stream. It only flows when, when you get rainfall in. So it was a little tricky to try to estimate loads on it. But you can see what the problem was, and that is that we had this steep hill going down, so everything was draining off, and then uh, the reservoir comes right back up in here, so everything was draining into the, into the river. So this was the excavation and the remedial uh, efforts. They actually had to put in some drains. They were, before, they were using wing ditches. There were about every 50 feet, there was a wing ditch going off because it was so steep that they had to control the velocity of the water coming off. And the only way they knew to do that was with wing ditches. And of course, that just exacerbated the problem. I mean, it was these wing ditches turned into canyons themselves coming off. And so they put in this subsurface drainage uh, so that to put this water in the pipes. And this is what it looked like afterward. You can see the vegetation was reestablished and it looks, looks real good. So this, the only uh, data I had was actually simultaneous data. I didn't have loading data because I didn't have continuous discharge, intermittent stream. But so what I did was to compare like discharge events, pre-treatment was the red, blue tree, blue was the post-treatment. And you can see the reduction that I, that I had in uh, seven load tons per year. So in this particular uh, magnitude of event, we went from about 50 tons per day down to less than one ton per day. So huge impact. And this was the final result. We had a 99% reduction in sediment. Uh, Pre-treatment was uh, 30.9 tons per day. And we went down to almost a nil. Uh, site three was one that you can probably relate to a little more. You can see the size of the stream much larger. The stream is about 20 feet wide, uh, four feet deep in some places. So this, this stream was pretty significant. Uh, channel of water. And same kind of problems we see everywhere in the coastal plain. <clears throat> this was the, the treatment uh, with the aggregate and treating the, the ditches. And that's just a close up of that chip seal. This is a 1600 acre watershed. Here's the Kaneka River. And the site was here, and the stream drains into the river. This was by suspended regression, only had two large vents. <clears throat> this was pre treatment, post treatment on suspended, and then uh, had a really good regression on the bed load. Only had a couple outliers. <coughs> I, I don't know what I did. I messed up something there. But, uh, and then I also put in uh, mean stream flow velocity. So this stream flowed at, at high flow about 1.3 feet per second. So it, it moves. And this was the bed load. I had one, one measurement that was almost uh, 30,000 tons per year. This, uh, this stream you would, you would stand you would stand in it, you know, waiting in it, and the sediment would almost knock you down. It was just you know, that much sediment just moving. So it was a real, a real problem. And uh, <clears throat> here you can see pre-treatment, post-treatment. Uh, post -treatment. Um, a great, we, you know, a large discharge event, 
and you can see how much lower the amount of sediment was. But we had some problems with, uh, with the treatment. This was part of the, some of the problems we had with the post-treatment stabilization. And then the result, uh, total load was 1,689 tons per year. We reduced that to 425, about 75% reduction. And then our site four, uh, which is Indigo Creek, flows in Gant Lake. Uh, I was telling somebody earlier, for those that, of you that know Mike Dubos, uh, what you infamous Mike Dubos, uh, his house is actually just right, right up here on Gant Lake. And this was a shot that I took when they lowered the water level. You can see how the sediment was actually, this was a pier. This man was devastated. He built his house up here, beautiful old house. They built a long pier, uh, and you can see he had about six inches of clearance between his pier and the sediment. So his, his little embayment here totally filled with sediment, and when they dropped the water level, he was encouraged, you know, it looked like all that stuff was going to move out. So there were just tons and tons and tons of sediment that would move further out into the lake. These are great um, uh, sediment traps. Most of our, our lakes in the coastal plain are just really nice sediment traps. I'll, I'll, when I show you the Dole Leaf data, a lot of people have forest subdivision in Daphne. They have a lake that they just love, Lake Forest. And that lake right now, about uh, a third of it, you can just walk. It's just <coughs> filled with sediment. And I told those folks, y'all have the best sediment trap I've ever seen in the day. not have <laughs> But you can see the volume here in this, I calculated the volume, about 19,000 cubic yards, uh, about 3.9 acre feet of sediment has been deposited in this little bay. This is another, this is just part of that same site, the steam plant road, and you can see the sediment moving down and then into the reservoir. It's beautiful, this is a beautiful place down here. If you haven't seen Gant point out, it's really pretty. And here's the remediation Okay, so, uh, but I didn't, I didn't have any final result because this, this remediation was part of our project. There's another road, another crossing just over here that the county decided they were going to pay, and we had just started our monitor, our pre-treatment monitoring, and we tried to talk them into waiting and let us get some data. They wouldn't do it, so they destroyed our project on site four, so we didn't get a final result. I was glad that they paid it, so it certainly helped save that, but the timing just wasn't good. It's either, it's either people or beavers. Those of you that monitor streams, um, beavers do a great job, but they can mess up a monitoring site. So we're always fighting beavers or people. Okay, so for our three sites, this gives you the, the blue is suspended, the, the yellow is bed load. And in our site four, which was Indigo, the data that I had from Indigo indicated that this was primarily a bed load stream. Uh, more than 90% of the sediment being moved by this stream was bed, bed sediment. These are very coarse grain sands. Uh, it's, it's my scene and, and these, are, these sediments are very coarse grain. Uh, you can see how GP1, our site one, being such a small stream, the total load is sort of insignificant compared to site three but you also saw the impact that even a small stream like that can have. So in your watershed, you might think that a small drainage might be insignificant, but uh, sometimes they're not. And I challenge you, uh, in these sand bed watersheds, uh, a lot of times you cannot tell, you know, you, you'll look at that stream and you'll say, well, that's a horrendous sediment load. But when you measure it, when you monitor it, it wasn't. But another stream where you might not think was that significant, we just have a huge load. So it's very hard to tell. You know, all these streams look the same. You've got, you've got sand rolling down the stream, and it's hard to tell uh, how much, actually how much sediment that stream is moving. Okay, so I'm going to show you two other things. Uh, one is our Lightwood Knot Creek, or what the locals call Ladder Knot. You know, where I grew up, I knew what a Ladder Knot, when I first came in that 
in that watershed, light would not. That, that didn't mean anything. Light or not. I knew what a light or not was. But I so anyway, USGS named the string. And obviously it was somebody from Connecticut or something. <laughs> so they called it light wood. But all the locals call it light or not. This is also in uh, Covington County. This is the uh, Yellow River uh, watershed. And uh, <clears throat> we have four sites here, but the, the advantage we had here, this was an, an EPA uh, and ADM um, non-point source, uh, what's that program called? It's, it's a national monitoring yes, project. Yes, national monitoring program project. And so we, what we had here, we had the ability and the funding to put in control sites and study sites. So we had some sites where we could leave, just leave them like they were, and then we had other sites where we could treat. And, and then we could, we had a, a, base, a base site, a baseline site, so then we could compare the two. So this was very helpful in being able to, um, and also this was a six year project, so we have tons and tons and tons of data on this this project. But I was just going to show you the, the result. And this was also uh, done uh, with uh, NRCS. Uh, <clears throat> you can see our control sites uh, and uh, in our pre-treatment period and our post-treatment period, we had very little change. So that was good. We didn't have a whole lot of climate change. And we didn't have anybody messing around the watershed that, that messed up our data. So we had very little change in our control sites, and that's what we were looking for. Um, but then in our treatment sites, we had we were able to, to measure this kind of sediment reduction from 1.1 to 0 0.05, and this is in tons per year, so this is a very small stream, and then we have a stream that had a very large load from about 700 tons per year down to about 200 tons per year. So we, we have a very good result here. This was primarily, well, it was three or four different things. We had uh, poultry in these watersheds, uh, we had cattle in the watersheds, and we had also had unpaid roads in the watersheds. So uh, the treatments made a, a great difference here. And we can talk more in detail about the treatments. I won't go into that here. And then the last area I want to show you, really, I, I told these folks in Baldwin County that they have a poster boy for for what you shouldn't do uh, with the watershed. Especially in an area where people value their quality of life. People in Baldwin County, you know, they live there because they value that quality of life. They live on Mobile Bay or down on the coast. Or, and so they love that area. But then you want, you want a good tax base and you want fast pro shops and you want all these people coming in and there's a price to pay for that. So they're trying, they're just trying to work it out. How do we juggle that? How do we get our quality of life and still have our economy? So they're struggling with that. And so I'm going to show you Dolly Creek Warshed. When you cross over uh, the I-10 causeway, you know, the I-10 bridge from Mobile in the Baldwin County on the eastern shore, Dolly flows in right there beside that hotel in the Burger King. It comes right into to the bay, right there, and then goes straight back parallels the interstate, all the way to the top of the hill. And it has Lake Forest subdivision in it, which uh, until recently was the largest single subdivision development in the state of Alabama. So this is 2003 land use. The red is, uh, commer is commercial development, uh, the white is residential, and then the, the dark, the green is uh, forest, and then we have a lot of ag up in the higher elevations to the to the south and the south, uh, I mean to the uh, southeast. Now this, had, since 2003, this has totally changed uh, because this entire area, that's where the Bass Pro Shops is, right up in here. So this entire area now has been excavated and is building out. And then uh, all of this area right here is now built out. That's where the, the shopping center up there, the, big auto dealerships and all that stuff sitting right up on the hill up here. And <clears throat> projections are that in, within 20 years, this entire watershed will be 100% built out. There won't be any, no more forest, no more ag. It'll all be built out. 
So what are they going to do? How are they going to handle this? So here's Dolly Creek is um, actually two major streams. Uh, Dolly Creek here and Tawasi Creek here. And then these are our monitoring sites. <coughs> Uh, this is this is the uh, main stem of Dole, uh, our site three. This sediment, these loads are in tons per day, and this is bed load. So we had I had one measurement where I, I had uh, I had about about 60 cubic feet per second, and I had a sediment load of about uh, 80 tons per day. It's a uh, I have never seen anything like this. This is a, a huge, huge load. Luckily, um, it all deposits right here in their lake. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't make it out to the, only the suspended sediment makes it out to the bay. So I told them, you have, you have saved the bay in your lake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so total sediment load going into the lake is 2,300 tons per year. And what I've told them is that they're going to have two phases of sedimentation. Uh, one is going to be multiple sources during development and construction, and they're seeing that right now. In the uplands, in the headwaters, they're building, excavating, taking down all the forest. So they're feeding sediment into those streams. Now, once they get built out, then they're going to have a huge percentage of impervious surface. Uh, they're no longer going to be putting a lot of sediment into the stream, but that stream is going to have a huge discharge with a large, large velocity. And so they're going to cut the sediment load off. That stream is going to establish a new base level that will be nothing like anything they've ever seen. This stream is going to erode laterally and vertically, mm -hmm. and they're going to, and it, it's going to take everything with it. Uh, and so they've got, before this happens, they've got a big job to do. And they're working on it. They're really working on it. This, they've established a group that is a wide range of you know, major landowners, developers, NRCS, ADM, us, uh, Corps of Engineers, everybody who, who would listen comes to these meetings. And uh, they, are, they are pursuing this wide open. They, they really want to do something here, and I think they're willing to. Okay, now we have seen, uh, now that we've got 55 sites, 55 watersheds where we've done, we've got all different kinds of land use. From national forests where we have no anthropogenic impact to uh, uh, row crop, we've got timber, we've got uh, uh, confined animals, we've got unpaved roads, we've got urban. And so I put a few of these out here because <coughs> That is the biggest uh, characteristic that we see with these sediment loads. Okay, uh, Yellow River primarily flows through the National Forest down there. It is the most pristine stream, stream that I've ever monitored in the state of Alabama. It's, it's a wonderful stream. And so Yellow River, we did uh, major tributary, which is Fry, uh, Fry Creek, and then uh, and then we did Yellow River itself. So there we had the lowest sediments, and that makes sense. About average about 10 tons per square mile per year. That's actually below the, the geologic erosion rate, uh, which would be a natural erosion rate. And then we have row crop in the uh, Choctahatchee River watershed um, that comes in at about four or five hundred uh, tons per square mile per year. And then we have one that's primarily row crop and timber, a lot of clear cutting in this watershed, which is up in Bear Creek, up in extreme northwest Alabama. Comes in at about 900 tons per square mile per year. And then we did one that was totally, total build out in the city of Tuscaloosa. We did all the <coughs> urban drainage for the city of Tuscaloosa. And that's these, we did uh, eight sites, and these are four of them right here, including Cypress Creek. This is Cypress Creek on the south side of Tuscaloosa comes in at almost 10,000 tons per square mile per year. Highest rates we've, we've ever seen. And then here is, um, 
Here's, here are the Gantt sites. So this is unpaved roads right here. Anywhere between 800 and 1,400 tons per square mile per year. And then uh, Dolly that I just talked about. So Dolly is going to go from about 1,000 tons per square mile per year, and it's going to end up here unless they do something. So you can see where unpaved roads is the second. I, I would consider, if I characterize according to land use, I would say that unpaved roads are the second largest sedimentation impact of any land use. Uh, a totally urbanized area where you've got ongoing constant uh, construction and you've got uh, a lot of impervious surface, uh, those are the worst. And then unpaved roads are the, the next worst. So that's, uh, that's what I had. I, I, so my purpose really today, because I'm not an engineer, was to hopefully uh, show you some some of these poster boys for, for what you don't want to see, and then to maybe spur some discussion about, well, you know, in our watershed, we've got this and that, and, and so what can we do? But then to show you that in my experience, if you get out there and you do the right kind of remediation, it doesn't have to be paid in and everything. But if you get out there and you do that, you're going to make a huge impact. Huge impact. The one reason that we monitor, though, is because in a larger watershed, there's not enough money in the world to treat every stream. You just can't, you can't do it. And so what we were trying to do is to give some of these folks an idea of where their worst problems were. Some, some of their trips that had the highest seven loads, and so you attack those first. So you attack the worst problems first, and you always, always, always attack your headwaters. Go from the headwaters. See, the folks at Dolly, the first thing, one of the first meetings they went, I went to, they said, okay, we know we got a problem, but the first thing we want to do, we got to dredge that land. We've got to, the landowners are just going crazy. We've got to dredge that land. And they've already dredged it once. And I said, you can't do that. And here's why. Because if you dredge that lake, then you're going to drop the base level. And the upper part of that lake, which is Dolly Creek, you're going to drop the base level of that stream six or eight or ten feet. Then, so you take a gradient that's like this, and you're going to make it this. So that all this sediment up here in the headwaters that you're putting in that creek, it's going to scream right into the lake. So you might as well just keep your dredge <laughs> sitting there, because you're going to be dredging all the time. So what you need to do, get up there in the headwaters, <clears throat> fix that, and then work your way downstream, and then the last thing you do is dredge that lake. Then, then you've got it. So, and, and they're, they're listening. So, um, so anyway, I, I hope we can have some discussion. I know we've got uh, plenty of time, and so uh, if I can answer any questions, I'd be glad to do it. Arlen, could you flip back to that last slide? I was just wondering, these are all in the coastal plain, right? No, or no, no. Uh, Tuscaloosa. Well, oh, these, these uh, oh, Tuscaloosa. all of the Tuscaloosa streams are are in the coastal plain. And Bear Creek, right? And Bear Creek. Bear Creek. Right. Okay. Uh, this is Rock Creek and Bear Creek. I had two sites on Bear Creek. So these are these are all Paleozoics. What I was wondering was, do you, would you expect a difference in that pattern? Or not really, de depend on your uh, physiographic province. You would you definitely would. Uh, the thing about uh, the thing about Bear Creek, uh, if you know anything about Bear Creek, it has a wide <coughs> floodplain, so that that stream totally flows onto alluvium. It's not it, it's not a it's not uh, it's not a coastal plain stream, but it flows on alluvium. And uh, well, it sort of is a coastal. A lot of the ridges up there are Tuscaloosa blue, and it's mainly sand and gravel. And, uh, and two, they farm that entire uh, floodplain. And what happened, if you know anything about Bear Creek, uh, Corps of Engineers and its eminent wisdom came in 30, 30 years ago. And they decided that they were going to alleviate the flooding for all those poor farmers in that floodplain who were farming right up to the creek. So they, they dig a channel straight channel 
right beside, sometimes it's beside the creek, sometimes it takes the creek. The only problem, and then, and then they said, okay, um, when it floods, um, that'll be in January, February, March. So when June comes, May and June comes, you farmers can go ahead and just plant the, the relief channel. Uh, you can just plant and harvest it. And, but they miscalculated how deep they dug the channel. So they dug it too deep. And so now it's an impoundment. They dug into the water table. And so it just, it's standing water. Um, and then the other thing that they do, so it's impounded, so it collects sediment. So every year they come in and they open up all the Bear Creek reservoirs and for about two weeks they drop the level of the reservoir so that they can uh, be prepared to hold water to alleviate some of the downstream flooding. And when they do that, it's a torrent for a week. That channel and it's straight. And so for a week they just they flood that thing. And the sediment loads that they take into the Tennessee River are unbelievable. I actually was monitoring. I monitored one event during that flow, and they do this in November every year. And I was I was I was walking up the stream to find where I was going to lay my section out so I could monitor, and I could barely stand up. You know, it was about this deep, and it was just ripping. And I ran into something, just butted into something, and it was a wall of gravel that high that was moving downstream and it was moving at a rate of about about a foot every five minutes and it was just rolling like this a wall of gravel three feet high and it was moving toward the river so it, that's a really spectacular man caused uh, a thing that they've done very free yeah. How would you suggest starting a prioritization if you were looking at a watershed for, I mean, I know you said headwater impact, um, but I guess Saga has to be an example. So looking at the unpaved roads, headwater streams. Yeah, um, I've never been in the watershed, but of course you definitely want to look at your land use you know, and see where you've got impacts based on your land use. And then um, uh, the other thing that, that I think works very well is to, for your major unpaved roads, to monitor upstream and then downstream. So that way you, you know what the impact of that road is. And what we saw our Light of Not Creek, our Light of Not Creek project, uh, Pat O'Neill and I had, were doing that. We were monitoring downstream, we were monitoring upstream. Upstream from the unpaved road, it was pristine, channel was, you know, three feet deep, uh, forest right up, you know, a lot of woody debris and the critters, I, I'm not a critter guy, but the critters apparently were the right kind of critters. And then once we got downstream from the Montague Road, it, it was like moonscape. Uh, the only things that lived there were those ugly uh, critters that can live in, you know, a sewer or that kind of thing. And um, so I think upstream, downstream, really good. That lets you know the impact of the road and then uh, look at your land use that can help you prioritize. Since we, we've seen that land use really, I mean, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. Yeah. So I think that's an easy way to get a handle on, on prioritizing you know, your trips coming in. Do you have any feeling or any data uh, about situations where you have unpaved roads and all you can afford to do is throw some riprap in the dishes. How much help is that versus, of course, it's not going to be near as much help as putting something on, on top of the surface, but but is that much help? Because I see one of our county commissioners here. And I, <laughs> well, I guess I can, you know, I mainly was where most of my experience is with that kind of thing is Cody County. And there, um, what happens is that the riprap gets gets buried. You no longer uh, you no longer see the riprap, but uh, and the channel, the, the base of the ditch is held. But then the erosion from the slopes and everything, it does it does seem to it, 
it makes a great impact to begin with, yeah. but then later on, I'm not sure that it's a, a lot of impact. But you've got to stabilize those ditches. Um, I mean, that's something you just got to do. But total impact when you're talking about all the contributions, I don't think would be you know, a major thing. I don't think you could do that as a single remediation and expect to have a huge impact. What, this is some, what related almost the same question again, but I know the specific BMPs have to be designed for the specific location, but there's certain elements, I guess, of BMPs that, that, that have impact, like revegetation or putting in river. What, what do you think is the most important thing as far as component of the BMP? Well, again, I'm not an engineer, <coughs> but just looking at this, you know, as a scientist, just looking at it, the, the thing that always caught my attention more than anything are wind ditches. <coughs> and so I had I had one in Steve down there in Covington County to really think out of the box. And I had, just before we did this, my wife and I were in Colorado. And we were there in May, just after when the snow was melting. Mm -hmm. And of course, out there in those mountain roads, they sand the roads uh, during the winter. They plow and they sand. And then, when the snow starts to melt, all that sand flushes off the road, and they want to keep it out of those tra trout streams. They do not. They will not allow that to get in those trout streams. So they have wing, sort of like wing ditches out there, but they flow into a catchment, uh -huh. into a, 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 a detention pond, and then they bring a, a track hoe out there, a drop, you know, and they just reach out there and they load it, and then they haul it and store it for the next season. And so I told Steve, I said, well, y'all ought to give that a try. You know, um, put in some detention so that you, you drain this off, but then you catch it. And he said, do you know what that would cost to, to have to load and haul that stuff? So, and I, I realized that. So you just end up letting the stream take care of it, and the stream will move it on down somewhere, you know. So <clears throat> the wind ditches always get my attention because there seems to be no um, there seems to be no alternative to a wind ditch. You got to do something. That water has to go when it gets to the lowest elevation. There's only one place for it to go, and that's in the creek. So you route it out there and put it in the creek. So that's the to me that's the major issue, especially in areas where you've got a road surface where you can stabilize. If you've got a stable road surface, the wind ditches are, are the big issue. To and getting them vegetated, right? Yeah. Where they want them. Yes. Just looking at these bar graphs, I'd, um, is it fair to say that when you've got uh, sandy soils in the coastal plain, you have a lot higher bed load than, say, clay soils? If you were measuring in the stream and you were measuring suspended sediments around in the Piedmont, um, would that be uh, much clo more accurate of a total load of sedimentation than, say, in the coastal That's plain. That's exactly right. It depends on, in the coastal plain, it depends on two things. It depends on the on the uh, grain size of the sediment. Um, if you've got clay uh, sediments, then you're going to have more suspended solid. It also depends on the gradient of the stream, the velocity of the stream. The higher the velocity, the larger particle that you can raise up in the water column, so the more suspended. A lot of, um, of the uh, Streams above the fall line, we don't, we don't, we can't monitor for bed load, and we just assume that everything is suspended, and I think that's probably a pretty good mm -hmm. assumption. Mm -hmm. So, uh, probably approaching 100 percent in a lot of those streams in, in the Piedmont or, or uh, in the Valley Ridge, probably a lot of those streams, we probably approaching 100 percent suspended load. Well, that's what I was thinking is in in Water Watch, one of our parameters is turbidity. It may be down in the coastal plain that may not correlate very well with total sediment, but up here in the Piedmont, it seems like it might correlate a lot better. Yeah, and that may be true. Uh, you know, I, I was approached by Alabama Power about two months ago, and really I had dusted off some of these old data sets because they had an issue that they had asked me about in the Alabama River where uh, tugs actually stir up the bottom. And they have turbidity issues. They have uh, they have regulatory requirements that they have to keep on the turbidity in in their uh, 
in their projects. And the tugs, and I, I saw this the other day, we were eating, my wife and I were eating lunch at Cypress Inn. If you know Cypress Inn, the restaurant tells us it sits right on the river. So if you get a front seat, you know, you're actually looking over the river. And this tug came up the river, and the, the, uh, the river, it hadn't rained in a while. This was too long ago. And um, the river was clear, and behind that tug, it was red, muddy. And I never realized that a tug, that the wash off the crop actually is so big that it pulls the bottom up and stirs it up. And so um, they were asking about correlations between turbidity and suspended solids. And I told them that I thought that in every case it would be almost a one correlation. I went back and looked at my data, and it's not. Uh, some streams correlate very well, turbidity and suspended solids. And some don't. Some are just terrible regressions. Mm -hmm. And now I gotta go back and figure out why that is. It can, um, intuitively, that makes no sense. Uh, turbidity should be measuring the suspended particles in the water, and so your total suspended solids should be a one to one correlation. But um, there's some other factor that I don't consider. But you, you may be right here that when you get up in, in the hard rock streams, mm -hmm. Really might start seeing much better correlation between turbidity and, uh, and suspended solids. Mm -hmm. and then all you got to do is just do a regression. You actually you rate, you'd be able to rate that stream mm -hmm. for turbidity and suspended solids. And then all you have to do is just measure turbidity and you can plug it right into your regression curve. Mm -hmm. Another question. Early on, you talked about the effect that falling sea levels have on erosion. Uh, out on limb here. What, what effect would rising sea levels have? The stream it would be exactly the result of reverse. The stream channels will aggrade, and so you will start at the <coughs> at the Gulf, and you'll start raising base level. All the streams will come up, which means you'll have um, you'll start having more and more flooding. These streams will establish like wider flood plains and. Uh, It'll be, I think the impact, the impact on people, I guess, would be a whole lot worse for rising sea level than it would be for a falling sea level. You're either going to lose, you're going to erode your channel and lose all the sediment, or it's going to be deposited. And then we start at the Gulf and we're going to get back upstream. Yes, sir. You talked about some different uh, methods of intervening. And some of the issues we're running through since I am the sole policy maker here right now. Um, there are a lot of issues we're running into. You know, first of all, it's the cost. Second is whose property is it that we're working on. And then you get into the issues of uh, uh, we, we plant less vegetation. And the next complaint we get is that the grass is too high on the side of the road. And I mean, so there's this ongoing thing. And everything revolves back to the, to the dollar. So when we're looking at it from a policy perspective, what of these interventions has the best bang for the buck? What what we can do that, that gives us the most value but costs us the least amount of money? Well, I know in uh, down the Florida Panhandle, they have, um, they're doing a, what they call a hilltop, hilltop remediation, and that is you only remediate those areas that are the major contributors. So the steeper slopes, uh, so you only you find out you know where the sediment is coming from most of it, and that's what you treat. You don't treat the whole thing. Right. Um, well, and then, and then you get into the political side of I paid part in, in some fashion. I have paid part of the road, and that's just I mean I'd be better off not doing anything politically than to do that. <laughs> While it makes great sense to this group sitting here because they understand that. The, the uh, goal of what we're doing, but um, you know, we've looked at riprap, we've looked at at uh, grassing the, the ditches, uh, which brings a whole new issue because you got to clear the ditches out at some point because of the buildup of uh, of the soils and all. So it's just a uh, it, it, there are a lot of great ideas out there. It's just how you pick which one works and which one can you apply and. And uh, I think that's going to require us to do some things 
that uh, involve trying one thing here and one thing over here. And, and I've looked at the wing ditches before, as a matter of fact, in the demonstration for us down on Moore's Mill Road, that's one of the things that they show is a way to control water. But the very issue you brought up of what to do with it is now starting to come forward because those wing ditches have been in place for several years and they've filled up and, and now they're just running free. So um, I'm just curious, has, has someone done that kind of research as to which one, or is it going to be a very site-specific kind of situation? Well, I think you definitely want to prioritize your sites. You know, you've got to prioritize because you can't, like I said before, you just can't treat everything. There's just not enough money to do that. So you, you right. do that first. Um, um, I, wish I, <coughs> I wish I could speak knowledgeably, and, and maybe that's the speaker y'all needed with somebody that could really talk to you about, or maybe that would be your next speaker, would be find somebody who's a real expert on all these different remediation techniques, you know, because there's so much out there. Uh, there. There are a number of ways that you can treat the road surface stabilize the road surface other than uh, pavement. That's correct. And so there's a, uh, my, you know, when we started GAN, my idea was that we were going to experiment. We were going to do each watershed would have a whole new set of, different set of remediations. And then, and then you find out what, but there were a lot of people down there that weren't willing to experiment. They didn't want to spend money on something that might That, I guess that's a good point. You know, put money out there and that fails. But you, you are never going to do that again. But that money is lost. So it was it valuable doing that? I think it is. But I'm I'm a scientist, so we, you know, we we're always trying to things. But uh, and the other thing is education. And you know, um, in in my career, we have seen so many efforts.